Today we're looking at our super sensitive skin, which cucumber is very important for, and also a delicious, healthy snack. Your skin does loads of different things. The main thing that I want to talk about today is that it is a sensory organ. It sends sensory information from things that are touching you to your brain 24-7, and you don't even need to think about it. In quiz fact, time! Oh, sorry, is it ready for quiz time yet? Let me deliver the fact, and then you can do the quiz time. In fact, the skin is the largest organ in the body. Quiz time! Did I time it right? You did. When you're a grown-up, how big is your skin? Is it A, half a metre squared, B, one metre squared, or two, no wait, B, two, three, C, or C, a massive two metres squared? Well, the answer is C, approximately two metres squared. That's right big enough to cover a car. Now get your finger, or in fact, you could even get a piece of thread or a feather and run it very gently along your arm like that. And you can feel that your arm can detect even the slightest of touches. But how does it do it? It's time to scientifically supersize our spectacular super sensitive skin. Time to bring in the digital microscope. Thanks, Billy. Now this is human skin, and so it's a lot like your skin. It's a lot like your skin because you're also a human. Unless you're a dog watching this with a human. If you're a dog watching this on your own, then who's a good boy? For our human viewers, we can see the two main layers of the skin. So Zan, zoom in there. So the top layer of the skin you can see there is called the epidermis. And that's the layer you can touch. And it's really, really thin, less than a millimetre thick. Below the epidermis is the dermis, and there's a lot going on in there. There are hair follicles, sweat glands, blood vessels, and lots of sensory nerve endings. And this is how your brain gets information from your skin. You can feel lots of different kinds of touch in your skin. So you've got special cells in your epidermis, in that top layer, that can feel light touch. They're called Merkel cells. And then you've got other special structures in the dermis with interesting names like Cassini corpuscles and Ruffini corpuscles and Meissner's corpuscles. But what kinds of information exactly does the skin send to the brain? Thanks, Billy. Chris, I have a perfect plan to find out. You're going to need a blindfold. This is my experimental equipment. <clears throat> Test number one. Ow! My pain receptors were activated. Perfect, Chris. You see, you have special receptors in your skin for pain. Right, test number two. Stick your arm out, Chris. Ugh. Tickly. So you have special receptors in your skin for light touch, something as gentle as a feather your skin is able to detect. OK, Chris, arm down. And finally, your skin's temperature receptors. Naughty. What is going on? Well, Chris, all your skin receptors are working perfectly from pain to light touch to temperature. But not all areas of your skin have the same sensitivity. We're looking at your sensory neurons. Uh, Chris. Yes, Sand. I've got someone for you to meet. I don't want to meet anyone, Sand. I'm preparing for an experiment. Yes, but you are really going to want to meet this person. Why? Because he's a lot like you. A lot like me? Well, in that case... Ah! Sand, this is not in any way like me. I mean, I don't have that enormous tongue, or these huge hands, or those ridiculous feet. Chris, meet your homunculus. Or, as I like to call him, homuncular Chris. <laughs> That is quite a good name. This is a homunculus. It's my body, but it highlights the places where I have the most sensory neurons by making those areas humongous. All over your body, you have sensory neurons, which enable you to feel things. They give you your sense of touch, but there are more of them in some parts of your body than in others. And this homunculus, homuncular Chris, yes, shows that you have more sensory neurons in your hands, feet, 
lips and tongue than you do in the rest of your body. And because there are more sensory neurons in these places, it makes them much more sensitive. Think about how it feels to have a piece of fluff in your mouth. It's intolerable. <laughs> but if you have a piece of fluff in your belly button, you probably don't even notice. To prove which parts of the body have the most sensory neurons is an experiment you can try at home. You just need another human and a blindfold. Right, Chris, put this on and lie face down on the bench. Now, I need Chris to be blindfolded while I prod him with my fingers. Prod me? I said lie down. I'm going to prod him and then I'm going to ask him how many fingers I'm using. And I'm going to start with his hand. OK, Chris, are you ready? Yes. Chris, tell me how many fingers I'm touching your hand with. Two. Four. One. Well done, but I expected Chris to get all that right because his hands are loaded with sensory neurons and the bit of his brain that gets information from his hand is very large. So your hands are very accurate at detecting what they're touching. But now we're going to move to his back. One. Maybe two. One. That was much less successful, Chris. That's because you have far fewer sensory neurons there, which makes sense if you think about it. You don't need your back to be as sensitive as your hands. That's very true. And your sensory neurons aren't just for testing how many fingers are prodding your back. Your millions of sensory neurons get loads of information about the world around you, telling you if things are sharp, soft, hot or cold. <laughs> What part of your body do you think this comes from? Is it A, your intestines, B, your eyes, or C, between your toes? The correct answer is B. They're cells called cones and rods from inside your eyes. Wow! Ouch! And now to our lab. But this time we've hidden it in a top secret location. So secret that even Zard doesn't know what it is. I am Lymph Node Man. It's time for some amazing experiments. Just don't try anything you see here at home. Today, we're taking a good look at the cells in your eyes. Hello. Did you know that you can see things that you're not even looking at? Try it. Keep your eyes fixed on my nose in the middle of your screen. Now, without moving your eyes from my nose, you'll notice that you can still see other things in the room around you. Perhaps you can see the television remote. Perhaps you can see a fish in a tank. Perhaps you can see your identical twin brother, Dr. Zahn, picking his nose at the lab bench as usual. <laughs> now, they'll seem a bit fuzzier than you, but you can see these things out of the corner of your eyes, which is why I know that Dr. Zahn is still picking his nose. What? Well, that's because our eyes use two types of vision at the same time. Central vision, which is here, and peripheral vision, which is all the way out here. So this is your peripheral vision area. If you were in the lab looking here, this would be your central vision area. And Zond and I would be in your peripheral vision area, looking grey and a bit distorted. Because you're watching us on a screen, you're actually seeing everything with your central vision. But we've altered this image to highlight what your peripheral vision sees. Oh, phew, back to normal. But what is going on? Why do things in your central field of vision look different to things in your peripheral vision? Well, it's all to do with the cells in your eyes called cones and rods. Now, come here and stand on my eye. OK, but you're going to have to lie down. No, and maybe no, I can... Not that eye, this eye. So that's what you did with all the gloves. Now, this is exactly what an eye looks like if you cut it in half. Well, it's not, is it? I mean, it's massive and it's made of green gloves. So this bit at the front here, this is the pupil or the black hole at the front of your eye. And light comes in here through the lens and hits the back of your eye or the retina. The retina covers most of the inside surface of your eye. Remember this picture? This is what the surface of your retina looks like magnified under a very powerful microscope. These cells are called rods, and these are called cones. We're going to show you how they help you see. Your cones, I'm rods. Let's make a retina. Your red cone receptors are great at seeing colours and details in bright light. 
You have around six to seven million of them in each eye, and they give you your central vision, which is why there's a higher number of these super cones in the center of your retina. Your blue rods are found at the edge of your retinas. You have around 120 million of them in each eye. They make up your peripheral vision so you can see things out of the corner of your eye. Now we're going to show you just how important your peripheral vision is. Zond, you're going to need these. The DX PVRG Dr. Zond Peripheral Vision Removal Goggles. Now I've put some blinkers on Zond so he can't see out of the corner of his eyes and he has only the use of his central vision. How are you doing, Zond? Well, I'm pretty annoyed, actually. I mean, you've stolen my peripheral vision. That's right, but it's all in the name of science. Now to understand what Zond's seeing, Put your hands around your eyes like this. It's an effect called tunnel vision, where you can only see what's straight ahead of you. Take a look at Chris's eye. This is one of my favourite views of the human body. And what you're looking at there is his iris, that brown coloured ring, which is incredibly beautiful up close. And in the middle of it is the pupil, and the pupil is the hole where light enters the eye. And the iris is constantly twitching and contracting to regulate very carefully the amount of light going into the eye. So if I shine a torch into Chris's eye, you can see how much the bright light affects the diameter of his pupil. There you go, look at that, look at how much it tightens up to prevent too much light getting into his eye. And then as I take it away, the pupil gets much larger again. Look at that relaxing. And the muscle that controls all of that is the sphincter pupilli muscle in Chris's iris. Let's have a look at another ring of muscle that joins your esophagus or food pipe to the stomach. Um, okay, I suppose so. If you could wrap your mouth around the slit lamp. Zand, I'm not going to swallow the slit lamp. I mean, we can use the image on the computer. Oh, uh, yeah. This is my esophageal sphincter. It's at the entrance to my stomach, and just like the one in my eye, it's a circular ring of muscle. Now, you have over 50 types of sphincter in your body, and they all open and close holes to let things through. Sphincters regulate light, blood, air, food, saliva, enzymatic fluid, mucus, poo, bile, urine, poo, you name it, sphincters regulate the flow of it. That was an impressive list. Did I mention poo? Yes, twice. The point is, there are far too many individual sphincters to count. You find them everywhere, even regulating blood flow through tiny vessels, and they mostly work without you ever knowing about it. Don't try anything you see here at home. Take a look at this. This is an MRI scan of my tongue as I'm speaking, and you can see it's pretty huge. But speaking isn't the only thing you need your tongue for. One of the best things it does is help you taste. Your tongue is covered in small hair-like projections, as I'm going to show you. Right, Zand, open your mouth nice and wide. Ugh! Oh, not hair like that. I said hair-like projections. You can't see them with your naked eye, so take a look at this. This is a super close-up of your tongue. This red blob is called a papilla. Your taste buds sit on the side of it, and they contain tiny hair-like projections called microvilli to help you taste. And if you look at your tongue, the bumps you can see are the papillae. And the more papilla you have on your tongue, the more taste buds you have, and the more sensitive to taste you are. And you have more of them than we do. Because we're doctors. No, Zahn, because we're adults. We have around 5,000 covering our tongues, but you have 10,000. That's twice as many. And to prove it, Chris, I've brought in a sample. This sample is nine years old. This isn't a sample, it's a child. Anyway, the point is, we're going to compare Chris's papillae with the samples. But first, I need to cover your tongues in blue food dye. The blue dye will show up all the papillae. And now, the sample. I have a name, you know, and it's my name. Very noisy sample. Give me your tongue. <laughs> Nice blue tongue, Hermione. Zand is putting a glass slide on both our tongues to make it easier to count the papillae. Chris's papillae are those little pale dots right there. And these are Hermione's. You can see that there's way more on her tongue, and that means more taste buds. Good job, Hermione. As we get older, your taste buds deteriorate aren't replaced, which is why you will be much more sensitive to strong flavours like garlic than your mum or dad. Today, we're sneezing. 
I'm going to show you something about sneezing that you won't know. And Zahn, I'm pretty sure that even as a doctor, you won't know this either. First of all, I need to get Zahn to sneeze. So why don't you try rolling up the corner of this piece of tissue paper and stick it in your nose. Really? Zahn, <laughs> cover your mouth. Oh, I'm covered in spit. So what happened there? I put something up my nose and my body just blew it out because I didn't like it. How does it clear your nose? Right, you, like, you sort of go <laughs> like that and just blow everything out of your nose. That's what you think happens? Yeah. This is really good. So even doctors honestly think this happens when you sneeze and that is completely wrong. So you don't blow anything out your nose when you sneeze. Everything comes out your mouth. And we can prove it to you if you look at this video of me sneezing. OK, here we go. I'm going. I'm going. I've gone. That's all saliva that was in my mouth, but nothing is coming out of my nose. It's only after I sneeze that my body will create mucus to flush out whatever irritated my nose in the first place, and that's when snot will come out of my nostrils. So we've shown you that when you sneeze, the spray only comes out your mouth. But imagine if Chris had been ill when he sneezed. Every single one of those droplets could have contained disease-spreading germs, and that's why it's so important to cover your mouth. Today's lab is all about the amazing Eustachian tube. My second favourite part of the body, after the epiglottis. Now, if you've ever swum down deep like Zand or been up in an aeroplane, you might have felt your ears popping or felt like they needed to pop. But why does it happen? Well, it's all to do with keeping the pressure inside of your head the same as the pressure outside of your head in the atmosphere around you. And to understand how they pop, take a look at this. Wait a minute, what is this? Chris, this looks suspiciously like my goldfish tank in which live my goldfish, Dolly and Dave. Don't worry, Zahn, they've just gone on holiday for a couple of days. On holiday? Hi, Zahn, we've gone to the seaside for a couple of days. See you soon, love, Dolly and Dave. Hmm. They didn't tell me they were going anywhere. Anyway, whilst they're away, they said I could use their tank. So this side of the tank represents the middle ear, the bit just behind your eardrum. And this side of the tank represents the outside world. And the water in the tank represents air pressure. There's high pressure in the outside world and low pressure in the middle ear. And this type of imbalance is really uncomfortable because the pressure pushes on the eardrum. And this is where your eustachian tube springs into action. Like this. When you swallow or yawn, it opens up, allowing the air pressure in the middle ear to equalise with the atmosphere around you. And it connects your middle ear to the back of your throat. But don't just take our word for it. We're going to show you where the opening to the eustachian tube is and what it looks like using this camera. I'm going to put it right to the back of my mouth, past the dangly bit, the uvula. Then I'll hook it over my soft palate and push it forward through my nose. The Operation Ouch sticker, that should be the opening to Zahn's eustachian tube. Now, we've never done this before, and I don't know if it's going to work, but we're going to give it our best shot. We can only do this because we're doctors. Right, Zahn, insert the camera. The camera's now going through Zahn's mouth. See the lab here, it's got the camera showing back at the lab. Now we're right at the back of Zahn's mouth, and that there is the entrance to Zahn's eustachian tube. That is an amazing view. There we go, we've actually found it. Wow. And if I shine this light up Zahn's nose, it shows you where the eustachian tube is in relation to his nostrils. What do you think, Zahn? Oh! So now you know where it is and how it works.